Uh, yeah, I am. I'm currently in uh, Northridge, so I'm directly above the rupture plane of the 1994 earthquake. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about that one today. Um, that's one of the best recorded, uh, one of the extremely well recorded earthquake. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about is the physics of historic but pre-instrumental earthquakes. Um, and so, uh, and I'm going to be giving some examples from California's San Andreas fault system. Um, and so just having heard the talks yesterday, it's like, yeah, the, the earliest thing I'm going to be talking about is still from the 1800s, which I know is uh, very recent compared to the historic records in a lot of the places where you're working. But um, I think there's still uh, a lot, uh, at least I hope that there's a lot from this approach that can be applied to places with older and longer records as well. Um, I'm just doing this in California because uh, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> So, uh, uh oh, come on, slides. Okay. So, I do want to preface this by saying I, I am not really an archaeoseismologist. I know this is the archaeoseismology session, um, but uh, sort of in my background, I am a dynamic rupture modeler. So, I use computer simulations to understand the earthquake process. And um, as Franz said, I, I, I do a lot of work on fault heterogeneity, especially in terms of things like uh, geometry and other emission conditions or fault geometry. Um, but I, uh, the reason I, I, I like to apply this to um, old earthquakes, and part of the reason is just I've always been interested in history, and I, I like this sort of interdisciplinary um, way of interfacing science and history. Um, but there also is the more uh, direct question of, like, if a fault has done something once, it can do it again. And so understanding the physical processes behind some earthquakes before we have any records beyond eyewitness accounts or maybe even just damaged artifacts, um, by getting into the physics of that, we can start to approach the physics and the questions of future hazard associated with those same fault zones. And I think this is, um, I mean, it's just interesting in, in general, but it's also um, feel like looking at this in a, in a detailed sense is also important just because as we have better and better instrumentation and records of modern earthquakes, um, we recognize just how many levels of complexity there are that may not be captured by a like there was a big earthquake in this place kind of statement. And so by trying to tie processes on what we understand of modern, uh, our modern understanding of complex fault zones back to historic events um, that can, again, hopefully get at the question of what is the future hazard? What kinds of events can we really, um, should we be zoning for and preparing for in these areas? So um, I'm not the one who does the, the literal digging. Um, I use a lot of paleoseismic data. I use a lot of historic data or I guess archaeoseismological data, but um, I'm not the one collecting that. Um, so I just wanted to, to preface that here. Um, so anyway, um, I apologize that my first few slides are a lot of words. I promise there are a lot of pictures later. Um, but as I was as I was saying, um, what I, 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 I use dynamic rupture modeling um, as a way to understand the physics of the earthquake process. It's a it's a technique that uses kind of everything we know about the physics of the faulting process to calculate um, synthetic earthquakes. Um, and so why would I use this for historic earthquakes as opposed to just, you know, trying to understand the fault breakdown process or more generalized questions of, um, rupture, of different effects on rupture behavior or on understanding uh, recent earthquakes? Um, well, again, I think that this can be a really good tool to help interpret a large set of um, more qualitative observations. Um, so in general, um, so I think this is a useful tool. Um, it, gets at, it gets at the physics of those observations. And a nice thing about dynamic modeling as opposed to static or kinematic is that I don't have to make an a priori assumption of what happened. I don't have to assume like, yes, it was this part of this fault. Um, I can basically put in a bunch of different possible faults and say, I'm gonna start the earthquake here under these conditions and I can see what happens. And so rather than going, you know, what needs to have happened to cause this presumed uh, sense of where the rupture was, I can go, okay, just where would the rupture go under these conditions? And then does that match what we know happened um, in terms of damage and felt reports? Um, in this method, um, as I said, the ruptures grow and progress based on the full physics of motion, stress transfer, and wave propagation. Um, so it is a, a really computationally intensive process, um, but it really is um, capturing the full physics. Um, it has momentum, it has elasticity, it has all the things. Um, it isn't just a slip or stress-based calculation. Um, 
And um, I can use observational information as inputs. I can use observed fault geometries. I can use observed stress conditions. Um, you can use all kinds of observations to set up what the initial conditions are. And then in return, I can, once I have the outputs of my models, I can compare them back to other observations because I can make the initial conditions be literally anything. I could make there be an 11.5 earthquake on a five kilometer long fault if I really wanted to. Obviously that's not realistic, but that's why using um, observations as inputs and then comparing outputs to observations is a really important constraint. Whether those observations are really dense instrumental records or whether there are a few people describing um, what fell down. Um, Another nice thing about this is I can see exactly what's going on on the fault. I don't have to be um, inverting for anything. And also because these are just um, initial condition based, I can test any number of scenarios, any number of nucleation points, any number of initial conditions, any number of geometries. Um, I can keep testing and probing until I find what matches the real thing best. So um, I think this is a really great method for interpreting old earthquakes as much as it's great for understanding the details of, um, of the physics in general. And so um, originally my next slide was just going to be getting at uh, getting right into one of the examples, but seeing the questions that I got from the uh, ADIT website, um, they're really great questions that actually fed kind of directly into some of why I think this method is so valuable. Um, so I'm going to quote you up here. Um, so Sarah asked, Sarah Bolton asked, um, when investigating large historic earthquakes in regions with multiple source faults, how can eyewitness testimonies be confidently linked to an individual fault if only a few records exist? And I think this is an awesome question because this is one of the big things I want to try to do with this method is figure out, okay, if there are a lot of faults and only a few uh, examples of what happened, um, can I figure out what makes the most sense? So um, in this kind of condition, I can test the possibility, all of the possible sort of faults. I can set up a model with a ton of different faults in it, and I can start the earthquake on any one of those faults and see which other faults are involved and see um, which of those scenarios um, matches the observations that do exist best. Um, I also, I usually do try to pull in um, like paleo seismic or geodetic or other forms of data as well, um, which I'll talk about in my examples. Um, but yeah, this um, is really ideally suited for testing all of the possible combinations of faults and seeing what is physically plausible and also what makes the most sense. So my level of confidence in linking an earthquake to a fault does depend on the results. Like in some cases, um, in, the, in the first example I'm going to give, um, there's really one kind of scenario that just plain matches everything best. Um, and in that case, I feel pretty confident about it. Um, but in some other work I've done, there are others that are just, you know, there are things that work equally well. And so I might not be able to say it was this one and not that one. But if they're both physically plausible explanations of the data, then um, they're both scenarios that should be considered for hazard. And so I think they're, that's still something useful to know. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I'll come kind of come back to a lot of points related to this as I get into my examples in a few minutes. Um, and then the, the other question I got um, from Maria Francesca Ferrario, um, uh, for a pre-instrumental pre earthquake, how can I disentangle between a single multi-fault rupture and a sequence of smaller events close in time? And this is another, uh, this is another awesome question because this is another kind of thing I exactly want to look at in some cases. Um, because very often you can have multiple faults, you can have um, multiple events, um, and this is sort of a balance of what do the records say and what does the physics say. Um, so if there are eyewitness accounts, you know, how many earthquakes do they describe? Like if they really only talk about one earthquake that lasts a really long time and did a whole bunch, then sort of the underlying hypothesis might be, yeah, it was probably one bigger earthquake. But if they describe like multiple shocks of, of similar level, or if they just describe a series of earthquakes, or even if, you know, they're sometimes they're a couple of years apart, um, just looking at what people have to say about what happened is kind of a, a really good um, baseline check. And another, um, I guess maybe I should have put these in the other order, um, is looking at the fault itself, like, um, if there is a sort of geometrical discontinuity or some other sort of thing that might be a barrier to rupture, um, it might be worth thinking about as uh, 
a possible set of multiple events uh, rather than a single larger event. Um, but this is another place where if there's slip data, that's really useful. Like if there's uh, paleoseismic slip per event data or especially slip in that specific event data, um, is the slip big or small? So if you have like a relatively low amount of slip over a relatively long rupture area, that might make me start to wonder, like, is this a sequence of events um, moving to smaller but adjacent sections of the fault? Um, or um, if it's a long thing with like a really big amount of slip in the middle, um, probably that my inclination would for that be that that's more likely to be a continuous rupture just because it has to be going for a while to make a, a really huge amount of slip. But again, that's just a, a baseline first thought. And I can test that with the physics to see, you know, does the rupture need to go that far to make that much slip? Um, is it likely to stop at this place and make a second event? Is it more likely to go through? Um, these are all things I can answer just by probing parameter space. And so, uh, so something, I mean, so this is something um, that I'm gonna touch on a little bit. Um, I guess the ones that I'm talking about are not like super, close together in time, um, but they probably would be indistinguishable paleoseismologically. Paleo so yeah, these are awesome questions because they're exactly the kind of things I want to get at with this kind of work. Um, so anyway, uh, some of the questions that are commonly associated with just pre-instrumental earthquakes in general are just which fault was it? Like who done it? Um, how big was it? How, how large of an earthquake was this? And, and how strong was the ground motion really? Um, or also where were the endpoints of the rupture? Um, and then also which way did it go? Um, was there a directivity effect that um, is important to know about? Um, and so all of these are kinds of questions that, uh, and I'm sure there are more that you can do with this, uh, um, with this method, but these are uh, ones that immediately come to mind for me. And these are all questions that I've worked on with regards to different earthquakes um, in California's history. And so um, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to, most of what I'm going to talk about is the, is the which fault was it question. Um, so for those of you who go to SCAC and go to SSA a lot, your first part of this talk is definitely stuff you've heard me give before, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but then for the how big was it, I'm going to talk about sort of a, a side result to another study I've been doing, and then I have a work in progress for the which way did it go. Um, so those will be less time at the end, um, but I have some examples of how this works for all of these questions. Um, so uh, the first question of the which fault was it, um, I'm gonna be talking about California's first recorded deadly earthquake. I mean, recorded like historically documented deadly earthquake. Um, and this occurred on December 8th of 1812 um, in Southern California. I'll have a map on the next slide. Um, and this, uh, this earthquake, um, was on, it struck on a Sunday morning. And at this point in California's history, um, pretty much the only developed structures, the only like built buildings were uh, Spanish missions, uh, Spanish colonial missions and associated structures. Um, the indigenous people didn't build things out of masonry because they knew better. Um, but this earthquake struck on a Sunday morning when a lot of people were praying in the churches at the various missions. And in this case, this is a picture of the stone church at Mission San Juan Capistrano in Orange County. And um, it, they never fixed it after this earthquake. Uh, this building basically collapsed inward and killed 40 people praying inside. It actually still ranks among California's most deadly earthquakes. Um, and this event was probably about a magnitude 7.5. Um, just based on the extent of the felt reports and the damage and the descriptions of the length. Um, originally, this was uh, associ people associated this with the Newport Inglewood Fault, which runs offshore of Orange County and San Diego County. Um, but then some really cool studies looking at uh, damaged tree rings along the San Andreas Fault um, suggested that, yeah, there was a large earthquake on the San Andreas Fault in 1812. And so um, for a while after that study was published in uh, the late 80s or early 90s, um, it, people were considering this to be just a San Andreas Fault earthquake. Um, but um, as it, starting in the early 2000s, more work has been done on the San Jacinto Fault, more paleoseismic work, which, um, so the San Andreas is here. It's, um, it's the Southern San Andreas, downtown Los Angeles is around here. Um, the black, the bold lines are the parts of the fault that I'm including in the model, but all of the black lines are, you know, this is the San Andreas. And then the San Jacinto um, is an, uh, another right lateral strike slip fault that branches off from the San Andreas and a Cajon Pass. There's a, about a 1.2 kilometer step between them. 
Um, and a lot of work has picked up more on the San Jacinto in the early 2000s. And um, sure enough, people have identified an early 1800s paleo seismic event on actually three strands on the San Andreas, um, the Mojave and San Bernardino sections of the San Andreas. Um, the, the Claremont section of the San Jacinto Fault, which is the one that's separated by a 1.2 kilometer step over from San Andreas. And then also the uh, Clark Strand of the San Jacinto Fault, which is a, um, which is four kilometer step over away from the Claremont. Um, and so actually we have, I know we have uh, Tom Rockwell listening, a lot of this San Jacinto work is his work. Um, but anyway, um, so all three of these fault strands have some significant uh, evidence of a significant rupture in the early 1800s. But in this, uh, and we know from the mission records that there were two damaging earthquakes in this time. We know that there was one in uh, November of 1800 that actually also kind of damaged San Juan Capistrano, which is over here um, and was felt along some other missions. Um, and then the um, 1812 earthquake, which uh, is actually what this, what the, uh, so the missions here are color coded based on damage in the 1812 earthquake. So the, it's, a, it's a more red, more bad color scale. Um, so San Juan Capistrano and San Gabriel were very heavily damaged in 1812. Um, San Fernando and, and Ventura, less so. San Luis Rey and San Diego felt it, no damage. Um, but here we have a case where there's two earthquakes, 1800 and 1812, but there's three disconnected fault segments. And so that brings up the question of one of these earthquakes has to have jumped a step over because um, the missions are older than that. The missions go back into the 1760s and 70s. Um, and so we know there's, there's two earthquakes, three faults. So one of them has to have jumped a step over. And so it gets at the question of was the 1800 earthquake a San Jacinto jumped this four kilometer step over or the 1812 earthquake and the 1812 just the San Andreas? Or was 1800 um, just the central San Jacinto in 1812 a multi-fault rupture? Um, so I admit that I came into this with a little bit of a, of a bias on what I thought the answer was, in part because my dissertation research was on this step over in the San Jacinto. Not in a historic earthquake sense, but just in a general sense of what would it take to get an earthquake to jump this four kilometer step over. Um, and as it turns out, um, I didn't in my dissertation work get any earthquakes that did that, that also had a realistic amount of slip. The earthquakes that I got to jump that step over had like 10 meters of slip, which is definitely definitely not something that bears out with observations. So my inclination was to think that probably um, the 1800 earthquake was confined to the central San Jacinto. And just because this step over um, in the San Andreas and San Jacinto was a lot smaller, it seemed kind of ripe for um, considering as jumpable. And so I wanted to get at this question of um, can the, uh, well, could rupture go between the San Andreas and the Northern San Jacinto? Is that a plausible explanation to match this paleo seismic event record um, for this part of the system? Um, so in, in doing this, um, and I have, uh, I, I use a 3D finite element method. So it's a fully dynamic um, rupture code called fault mod. Um, use slip weakening friction, which just is a simple formulation that says the fault gets weaker as it slips further until it hits some critical um, value. I'm using fault geometries from the SCEC community fault model and local mapping, um, mostly work of Nate Onder, Duncan, Tom Rockwell. I use a regional stress orientation from seismicity literature. Um, and so I can talk more about that at the end if people want. Um, a realistic velocity structure from the SCEC community velocity model. So in this case, I'm using all kinds of modern observational inputs to try and make as realistic of a setting as possible for this old earthquake, or I guess old for California earthquake. I know 1812 was not that old for those of you in Europe. Um, and then uh, in order to start the earthquake, so I can't just start the earthquake uh, synthetically. I have to start, well, I mean, automatically, I have to start it by raising the shear stress, basically by kicking it really hard, by forcing it to start. Um, and so just to, um, jump over a lot of the nitty gritty. Um, this is what my model geometry looked like. I may have the, I've modeled them as vertical strike slip faults and these three dimensional geometry with the step over in here. This is this bottom one is kind of a, a cross section, well not a cross, a uh, like looking down into the earth view. And this top one is a is a map view. And the reason I have the area so large is so I can ultimately look at the ground motion around these um, missions. So San Fernando, San Gabriel, San Juan Capistrano, and San Luis Rey. Um, 
And long story short, uh, I got a lot of multi-fault ruptures. Long story short, it is actually uh, under these conditions from observations, very easy to get a rupture to jump between the San Andreas and San Jacinto faults. And I'll show you those on the next slide. Um, but I do want to say that I did, um, I wanted to see, was it possible to match the slip per event by um, having an earthquake on one fault or the other? And it really wasn't. Um, any earthquakes that did not jump the step over between the San Jacinto, any model earthquakes that didn't jump that step over, either were just too short to match the paleo seismic records, like they didn't slip at sites where slip was observed, or the amount of slip was just too low. Um, so in order to produce something that matches these slip, these paleo seismic slip per event, um, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't put the I didn't I should have put a reference for all of these sites um, on here, and I didn't. They're in the paper. Um, in order to get the appropriate amount of slip at all of these sites, um, I had to have a multi fault rupture. Um, just slipping the San Andreas didn't produce enough slip on the San Andreas. Just slipping the San Jacinto did not produce enough slip on the San Jacinto. So that um, really um, sort of matched with my thought of this is an easier step over to jump than this other one, since I've modeled both of them. But does it make sense for 1812? Um, well, actually, here are the, uh, so here are the individual models. Here are just six examples. These are now kind of looking at the faults, um, kind of the, the top, the, uh, so here's the San Andreas, San Jacinto. Um, the top of the earth is the top of the bar. Um, and uh, they kind of align where they align. These white lines are paleoseismic sites. So, um, so if I start the earthquake kind of at the other end of the San Andreas or smack in the middle of the San Andreas, it doesn't jump, but it's also much too small. All four of the others, whether I start at the northern end of the San Andreas, at the junction on the San Andreas, at the junction on the San Jacinto, or the southern end of the San Jacinto, all of these are multi-fault ruptures. All of them um, match the observations pretty well. Um, they all are sort of within the range of observed slip per event for these earthquakes, or for these paleoseismic sites. So that says, yes, 1812 could have been a multi-fault rupture, and I think it probably was. But um, you know, all four match most sites well, none match them perfectly. Um, this does say that you know, using modern initial conditions can help tell us some things. But I felt like I could go further and um, get at the question of which scenario fits best. Because now I have four possible options. There are four multi-fault ruptures, but they're four pretty different multi-fault ruptures. And so um, in order to figure out what fits best, that's where I'm gonna bring the historic records back into the picture and also some more geologic data in the form of precariously balanced rocks. Um, so uh, around the set step over between the northern and central San Jacinto, there are a lot of these guys. Um, but there are very, very few of them elsewhere along the San Jacinto, despite the whole thing being in the Paris block, which is a pretty um, sort of uniformly fractured, um, well, not uniformly fractured, but like a uniformly jointed um, block, a granodiorite block. Like it's the same stuff around these faults. But there's a lot of these precarious rocks, uh, and it's the same like weather conditions too. So they should you would expect similar weathering, but um, you see a lot of PBRs near the step over, and not a lot elsewhere along the San Jacinto. And this is actually kind of what motivated my dissertation research to look at that step over. And in that research, I found that these precarious rocks in the step over are really sensitive to southward direction southward directed rupture on the northern San Jacinto. So if rupture is coming at them from north to south, they would be much more likely to topple. And so the fact that the rocks are there, meaning they haven't been toppled in multiple cycles, kind of suggests to me that ruptures going away from them seem to be something we should be looking for. Um, so what I did then was uh, plot the model ground motions, um, so the model particle velocities um, from the simulations that I ran, compared both to the missions and to the distribution of precariously balanced rocks. Um, so these are four map view pictures. Uh, the star marks the nucleation point, the red circles are the missions, and the white circles are precariously balanced rocks. Um, this is once again a more red, more bad color scale. Um, so starting the earthquake on the northern end of the San Andreas and rupturing it to the south kind of doesn't hit what it needs to hit. It does have strong motion at San Juan Capistrano, but kind of less at San Gabriel and, and San Fernando, despite them being heavily damaged. Meanwhile, this is a strong southward directed rupture at these rocks that are sensitive to southward directed rupture. Um, so that's kind of missing all of the marks 
Um, meanwhile, starting the rupture at the junction on the San Andreas or on the San Jacinto produces two very similar bilateral ruptures. Um, in this case, um, they both match the missions better. They both have um, strong shaking at, at San Fernando, San Gabriel, and San Juan Capistrano, but they still have this strong southward directed motion towards the precariously balanced rocks. Um, but if I start the rupture on the southern end of the San Jacinto, it kind of hits everything it needs to hit. Um, it's a northward directed rupture. Most of these rocks are in the blue rather than in the yellow or uh, orange. Um, and also its rupture is away from them. It's northward directed. Meanwhile, um, San Gabriel, San Juan Capistrano, and San Fernando are all in zones of strong shaking and San Luis Rey is not. So in this case, um, looking at a dynamic rupture model to match paleo seismic slip per event and then comparing the ground motions from that model to uh, fragile geologic feature and historic data says to me that the best model is for this earthquake is a bilateral rupture of the San, or not bilateral, a multi-fault rupture of the San Andreas and San Jacinto faults that starts um, near the southern end of the Claremont section of the San Jacinto and propagates to the north. Um, this is also interestingly consistent with um, the idea of a northward sequence across the San Andreas system with uh, the southernmost part rupturing in the early 1700s, then this in 1812, then 1857 further north, and finally 1906 on the northern section. Now, of course, I can't prove this. This is a model. I can make it do anything. But um, the fact that it is consistent with all of these different forms of observation says that it's physically plausible, which again means that it's a hazard worth considering. That a 7.5 multi-fault rupture is just as plausible for this area as a 7.5 San Andreas only rupture. Um, yeah. So there is um, the, the sort of which fault was it question. So this is this is completed work. Um, this is uh, my uh, 2016 paper in Science Advances. Um, but now I'm going to switch gears to talk about some other uh, stuff that I've done on or that I work, I'm working on on some of the different questions and some different earthquakes. Um, so an example of addressing the how big was it question, um, I'm going to be look, talking briefly about the 1868 Hayward Fault earthquake. Um, so this was known as the Great San Francisco earthquake up until the 1906 earthquake caused heavy damage across the Bay Area, destroying buildings in San Francisco and, and uh, in the East Bay, so San Leandro over here. This was very widely felt and very damaging. Um, it's typically interpreted as a 6.8 to 7.0, usually based on the strength of the shaking, but also based on um, surface rupture, except uh, because the Hayward is a partially creeping fault, um, it's kind of unclear how much of that surface rupture was true surface rupture versus rapid afterslip. Um, more recently, uh, Huff and Martin have done a, uh, a reevaluation of the first-hand accounts that say this probably only needed to be a 6.5 to do what it did. And so um, my work on this one is actually less about, um, less start, it didn't really start as a, as a project about 1868 and more started as a project on investigating the effect of aseismic creep on rupture propagation. Um, so the Hayward is a partially creeping fault. There's well-documented creep along its whole surface, but different locking patches at depth. Um, and uh, in this case, um, I was doing work with Gareth Funning um, at uh, UC Riverside to look at whether the creeping patches inferred from GPS inversion, um, what they do to the rupture extent. And so he was modeling the interseismic creep distribution. Then I used those as, uh, used that stuff as uh, set up for dynamic rupture models to see how far a close seismic rupture could propagate based on the creep distribution and stress um, accumulation based on that. Um, and so that's a whole other project, and I don't want to get into that too much. I can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but basically, um, what I found in doing these uh, dynamic rupture models um, is that uh, the creep absolutely does limit the rupture extent. Um, and kind of under a number of different initial stress like maxima, um, the, the creeping sections on either end of the fault kind of keep the rupture confined to this area underneath Berkeley through Fremont, which is the area that had the strongest effects in 1868. Um, so, and, and um, especially um, what, what we kind of did is then Gareth would run some afterslip based on um, my dynamic models, and then we kind of kept tuning things to figure out how much stress drop does there need to be for his afterslip and uh, reaccumulation of stress to match the um, 
recurrence interval for this fault, which is inferred to be between 120 and 180 years. So um, I'm just going to go to that point. So yeah, the creeping zones limit the rupture extent. Um, the loading rate requires a pretty low stress drop um, uh, of uh, about 3 MPa. And in my models, it produces these ranging from magnitude 6.4 to 6.65 earthquakes. So those were pretty small, um, kind of focused on the central Hayward. And so my thought was, okay, if this is the kind of earthquake I'm getting that, you know, matches the uh, creep distribution and the recurrence interval, does this look like 1868? And so I thought I would, you know, plot the ground motions from my models. And now um, to just to see if it matches the, um, the uh, historic accounts. And so um, I will say a caveat with this figure, um, what I have here is uh, the intensities from Huff and Martin's paper um, with, uh, are in uh, the colored numbers. And then the actual shading is the ground motion from my model. I will say the caveat, there's not any side effects in my model yet. This is not the real velocity structure. Um, uh, so even in my model that is in homogeneous rock, um, just this, uh, and this is a 6.4, this is one of the smallest earthquakes that came out of my simulations. Uh, this overall pattern um, still fits pretty well on a first order way. The uh, strongest motion is in these, these lobes of brighter color um, shooting out from the fault. Um, you get lower motions sort of in the zones between these lobes. Um, and again, the uh, just kind of follows decently well, um, especially considering this model is in granite. Um, the real deal has a ton of soft bay mud, very liquefaction susceptible, very strong motion from not a lot of earthquake, honestly. And so especially, um, that's especially pronounced um, sort of towards the southern end of the bay where these higher intensities are. So while I wouldn't necessarily say this is a model of 1868 yet, it shows that a pretty small earthquake um, especially when you consider that all of these intensities would be amplified by the um, velocity structure. A, pr a pretty small earthquake can cause pretty big shaking in this area, which kind of suggests that maybe 1868 was more in this mid sixes range rather than low sevens. So, um, and the last thing I want to talk about is the uh, which way did it go question. And with that, I'm looking at the great San Andreas earthquake of 1857. Uh, so this is work in progress. Um, so I don't have any super big conclusions on this yet. Um, but basically this is a, you know, sometimes you might've heard it as the Fort Tejon earthquake. And this is a, a rupture that goes from um, Chilam in central California to uh, near San Bernardino. This is a, like a 250 kilometer long rupture. Um, it's the most recent large earthquake on this section of the San Andreas. Um, in some places it had up to seven meters of slip. Um, and it's inferred to have been a 7.8 or 7.9. Um, usually this is inferred to have started near Chalem and ruptured to the south because there was a foreshock up in this area earlier on the same morning of January 9th, 1857. Um, but my personal thought is, especially looking at something like Ridgecrest, you know, how there was a 6.4 one day and then a 7.1, like on an adjacent fault, but not starting immediately next to it the next day, you can have earthquake sequences that don't start in the same place. So my personal thought is that just because there was an earthquake up here doesn't necessarily mean that um, the second earthquake has to have started in the same place. It could have been an area down here that was really, or anywhere else along this trace that was close to go, close to going off and the effects of the foreshock might have uh, gotten it uh, rupturing. Um, but this is also, a, it's a pretty uncommon event, paleoseismically speaking. Most of the records uh, don't have rupture going around the Big Bend. They're either just the Mojave or just the Carrizo. And so I started working on this, just trying to figure out what does get rupture around the Big Bend. And I haven't gotten rupture around the Big Bend yet. Um, but, uh, so I haven't matched this earthquake. But um, in this case, uh, so these are all the, the, the San Andreas. Um, and here I have in or light orange, my model slip distribution in dashed orange compared to an observed slip, uh, slip distribution for 1857. If I start the earthquake in Chalam, it just stops at the Big Bend. It just stops. Um, the slip there looks pretty good, but then it just stops. Uh, but on the other hand, the ruptures that go the furthest are ones that I start further south. Um, and so I still have this interesting problem if it just skips like a 50 kilometer section of fault. Um, so I'm working on that. But the ones that go further, no matter what I tried, are the ones that start to the south and rupture to the north, which raises some interesting questions about 1857 beyond just how do I get it around the bend, but 
what if it didn't start where we thought it did? And so um, that's another place to then bring the eyewitness accounts back in. Um, so these are some isoseismals uh, based on um, eyewitness accounts for um, and felt reports and damage from 1857. Um, at this point, um, the the you know the dense population was in the Bay Area, but also um, San Bernardino, which I should have put on this map and didn't, but is is here, um, was actually one of the largest cities in Southern California at the time. And so you would think that you know a, a 7.9 charging to the south with all of its directivity pointed right at San Bernardino would, um, they would maybe uh, have some more to say about that. But most of the eyewitness accounts from San Bernardino are, uh, are a lot less violent than you'd think. Um, so I'm actually, I know I'm, I'm running later than I need to be, but I do want to read a little bit of an eyewitness account, both because it's a pretty great account and also because I think it's kind of indicative. Um, so this is from a woman living in San Bernardino and she goes, um, at 10, past, uh, 10 minutes past eight o'clock, we were visited with a shock of an earthquake, which lasted near as I could judge about three or four minutes. I arose from the breakfast table and went to the kitchen to take another cake in order to finish my meal, got the cakes in my hand, when suddenly I felt a dizziness in my head, which was succeeded by a sick and nauseous feeling at my stomach. I concluded I had already eaten more than was for my interest, and I put the cakes in my basket. I finally began to stagger and reel like a drunken person and caught hold of a chair and sat down. By this time, I realized that everything was moving around me. And then uh, she goes on to say um, that uh, uh, some minutes after it was over, a certain rumbling could be distinctly heard in a northern direction resembling a distant cannon. So in addition to this just kind of being hilarious because she thought she ate too much cake, um, this isn't this doesn't indicate like strong enough ground motion to say like in my mind at least that the that it's coming towards um, this and especially with that you know rumbling from the north for a while after that to me as someone who's worked on rupture directivity and knowing that strong motion goes in the direction of rupture it sounds kind of like the rupture is going away from San Bernardino to me. Um, and similarly, the isoseismals show that um, for all the felt area is wider to the south because there is more population across here, um, the higher intensity is further to the north. So this is kind of interesting um, about uh, just, you know, what's going on here? Was this a southward or northward directed rupture? So that kind of brought this up as a totally separate question to me from how does it go around the bend? And so this is something I'm still working on and hopefully I'll have an answer on that soon. And I'm looking forward to digging into more of those accounts um, to kind of shore that up. And so, uh, so some take home thoughts. Uh, so yeah, I think eyewitness accounts and historic damage reports are really useful for motivating and constraining physics-based modeling. Because um, a model can do anything, the more data sets that can be used to constrain it, the stronger the model is, especially when considering real world hazard. Um, but on the other hand, physics based modeling can help constrain um, the processes of historic earthquakes. It can help us understand things that have happened in the past, which can therefore help us constrain or think about hazard for things in the future. Um, and so I think really, I, I hope I've shown that different kinds of data sets can work really well together, different methods that might be worlds apart from reading historic newspapers to really uh, uh, intensive physics-based modeling. They can really be used together, and especially in situations where there's gaps in one data set or another, um, interdisciplinary approaches can really meld those together in a cool way. And I look for, I hope to see like more people doing this kind of thing where combining different data sets. So with that, um, I, I see Franz has come back on. He's probably about to cut me off. That was my last slide. Um, so thank you. <laughs>